Welcome everybody and welcome to our showroom here in Italy and for this occasion on the Hertz side. How are you, Ken? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Luca. Uh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, but I'm wishing I was in Italy with you. That's why I have this <laughs> background of your beautiful Hertz showroom that you built. So I'm excited to start on these Hertz webinars. I want to learn more about the history of the brand and the technology that you use. Well, I will be happy to take you into this journey. So let's get this episode starting. I want to know how Electra Media decided to create this new brand. And didn't, wasn't it originally just for speakers? No, oh, yes. Yes, you're right. And well, that is a phrase that would apply to this situation. Begin by doing what is necessary, then what is possible, and suddenly you will find yourself doing the impossible. That is a great quote. Who said that? <laughs> San Francis, an Italian saint, a poet, and a very active religious person, convinced that if you are not happy with what you have around, you should start from something and be the change yourself. So you guys were looking for something you couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there were a lot of speaker brand around, but they were not really matching with our electronics products and with our vision of in car audio. So in year 1996, Electromedia began to develop its concept of car audio speakers, and we had three big goals. Sensitivity and efficiency, of course. Well, that's really important in cars because we always have limited amplifier resources. And then advanced designs able to perform in various temperatures and conditions. Also looking for a flexible in performance, driver able to deliver good sound in various installation locations. And then last but not least, high-end product designed to match with the car interior. Well, I remember back in 1986 when I started, we definitely had some auto sound manufacturers selling us drivers that were really made for home audio. They didn't look that good in cars and they had some performance shortcomings and that did lead to us blowing up a lot of tweeters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also what we kept in mind during the engineering. Being demanding and with the willing to come out with something new, it took two years to deliver a speaker line, the high energy. The high energy has been a great breakthrough in the car speaker landscape. Specialists could not believe to their ears. Their requests were finally fulfilled. And we deliver innovative solutions for difficult speaker installations. And we explore the free air technology with outstanding results. The brand grew in the world and thanks to prizes and international recognition. Here, the middle line was announced in year 2005. Customers are still asking us for this ML500R ribbon tweeter. We went also big and bold. Let's consider the ML5500 a research and development exercise for free air sub technology. In 2006, we added amplifiers to the range and I was a young guy traveling the world to promote the brand. Oh, uh, look at you. <laughs> Things were very serious. Prices were falling from the sky. The international demand went up to the stars. Okay, but going back to your mission for doing something different, what was it that you needed that you couldn't find on the market back then? Well, from our side, there was an urgent search for high sensitivity, a good response in the car, better than in display board, high-end drivers adaptable to car interiors. Actually, these were the main ones, but much more was on the bucket list. So, so that's where we started and here where we've arrived. To avoid sharing the know-how with external suppliers to stabilize the production source and to meet our quality requirement, we decided to invest and open our speaker production facilities, 100% of our property, producing car audio speakers exclusively for us. And nowadays we count more than 120 articles in our catalog, divided in all the variety of car speakers, amplifiers, and DSP. 120 items for just car audio? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and there's more than that. We became specialists also in marine products, counting with all a full range of dedicated speakers, electronics, DSP, and accessories. Well, different applications add more challenges, I would think. You can tell, yeah, you're correct. 
As you can see from this picture, the open air and noisy environment, the location and the natural agents are requiring the utmost engineering care. Well, the music also has to be heard outside the boat. <laughs> yes, of course. And the research and development on the marine line has been extremely demanding, presenting us totally different scenarios compared to the automotive application. And because we like to face difficult challenges, last year we have launched groundbreaking components specific for motorcycle use. Motorcycles? You guys are putting sound in anything that moves, aren't you? Yeah, I can confirm. All that is moving and want to be loud. For example, horn tweeters for bike use required vibration resistor mounting and outstanding SPL performances. A careful weight and dimension control is needed. As you can see here is the SV165neo. It is engineered also for motorbike use as half of the mass of its automotive counterpart, SV165. And the high output woofer demand over dimension mid and high drivers to keep up in the coaxials. Speaker cone must be both water resistant and efficient to allow to be heard in the most noisy bikes in the world. Well, all that sounds like a big challenge, <laughs> especially for a company like yours that doesn't want to compromise when it comes to sound quality. Exactly. And of course, there will be dedicated webinar episode for marine and motorbike in the near future. But today we will focus on high performance auto sound. Is that right, Ken? Yes, absolutely. I've spent a lot of time studying the Hertz product line. And, and before we go through my questions, I would like to share with the audience a, a couple of technical concepts that might help us all be on the same page when we talk about speakers. I promise I'll do my best to keep it interesting. Permission given. However, my mission today here for this episode is to persuade you to buy a Miele Legend system. Do you accept the challenge, Mr. Ward? Uh, I'll accept the challenge, but my wife told me I'm not supposed to buy any more car speakers. <laughs> okay, let's start with some very basic acoustic ideas. You may know some of these already. Um, of course, our ears detect air pressure changes, and it is generally understood that we are going to hear from about 20 changes a second, which is ultra low bass, to around 20,000 cycles per second, which is very high treble. And high resolution recordings now even go higher than this, of course. So we need to be able to compare sounds at different frequencies of vibration to know what to expect and see how different they are. So we're gonna break this audible range up into octaves. And an octave is a range of notes covered by doubling a note or by cutting it in half. So let's start here at a thousand cycles a second, which is in the mid range. And we will go one octave below a thousand. So if we cut 1000 in half, we will be at 500 cycles. And that span is called an octave. Now, if we go up an octave, we would be doubling it to 2000 cycles a second, that's still an octave. And the reason that this is important is that our ears don't hear differences in a linear fashion. The difference between 500 and 1000 sounds just as important to our ears as the difference between 1000 and 2000. And that same rule goes on and on through the audible range. And this is gonna be important to understand in, in a minute. So, so bear, hang on to that one. Now a speaker's job is to recreate the air pressure changes that were created in the room that the music was originally performed in. And the way speakers do this is by moving back and forth, pushing on the air, and the air pushes on our ears. And I'm gonna show you really quickly how to make a simple speaker at home. So first, you need a paper plate, and that's gonna be the cone. And then you're gonna need a cardboard tube, and you're going, that's gonna be the voice coil former. And then we need a scrap of wire and we're gonna wrap it around the tube and it'll form a coil. And then we need a big magnetic donut. Donut? What are you talking about, Ken? I'm sorry, Luca, I forgot. You probably don't have magnetic donuts in Italy. Okay. Not at all. How about this? Is this better? Uh, that looks more familiar, right? <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the tube and glue it to the bottom of the paper plate. And now it is a handle and we can push the plate back and forth. We're gonna wrap the wire around the tube and we'll insert that whole assembly into the magnetic donut hole. And there's a positive magnetic field inside the magnetic donut hole. 
So in a real speaker, this would not be enough. We would need to redirect the magnetic field to be focused enough for the speaker to really work. And we will talk about that in a minute, but this is the basic idea. Now, if we send positive electricity through our coil of wire, there will be a positive magnetic field around the coil of wire. It will be an electromagnet. And there's already a positive magnetic field in the donut hole. We know that similar magnetic fields will repel and push each other away. So our paper plate will get pushed out away from our donut. Look, hold on. Instead of talking about paper plates, donut holes, which also makes me hungry, by the way, can can we show them a picture of a speaker, maybe? I, I can show you a picture of a speaker. I forget it's dinner time in Italy. Sorry. So <laughs> here is a speaker, and we can see here the cone would be the paper plate, and this voice coil here in the center would be the wire, and then the magnet right here that we see in the cutaway would be our donut. But this is not really a donut. This is a Cento 165 millimeter woofer. Yeah, right. Uh, there is a little bit more to it than that, right? Yes, there is. This is the basic principle. You can see here on this speaker that there is a dust cap in the center of the cone. On this speaker, there was a hole in the cone, and we don't want dirt or dust to get into the speaker motor. You can also see the surround and the spider here. They are the soft suspension parts. They keep the cone and coil centered in the hole. Now, the frame, everything holds the frame. The frame holds everything in place. And you can see here the top and the back plate on the, the magnet are like a sandwich. And they help shape the magnetic field along with this pole piece, which sticks up inside the voice coil. Now, remember, we were sending positive electricity through the voice coil, and the cone was moving out, right? Because they, the, the magnetic fields were pushing against each other. Now, if we switch the electricity on the coil to negative, then we'll have a negative magnetic field on the coil, but the donut still has a positive magnetic field, and that will pull the cone back in. Now, if we're trying to create air pressure changes, we have to push in and out. So if we switch our electricity, positive, negative, positive, negative, the cone will move in and out, in and out, and we will hear air pressure changes at our ears. And that is how speakers basically work. I want to tell you two rules about how speakers work beyond this. And these two rules will help you understand why we have speakers that are different sizes. Now, like all rules, they have exceptions, but I really believe these two concepts will help us understand speaker operation better. And the first rule I call the rule of excursion. And we're going to apply this to the most common speaker in car audio, this speaker right here, a six and a half inch speaker. And what the rule of excursion says is that if the speaker is playing a note and then we want it to play a note one octave lower, that speaker will have to move four times as far. If it can't move four times as far, it's not going to play as loud as it should, or it'll damage itself and rip itself apart. Now, when we apply this rule, we're going to oversimplify a little bit. We will not talk about subwoofer enclosures and vented or any kind of subwoofer enclosures here. We're, we're just talking about free air behavior of a speaker. But here, stick with me for a second. Let's say we send our speaker a thousand cycle note and we set our volume so that the speaker has to move 0 0.1 millimeter. A tenth of a millimeter? Is that all? Are you sure? Yes, that is so little. We couldn't see the cone even moving. If you put your finger on the cone, you could probably feel a small hum. Now, we will drop down an octave, and we, we already said an octave below 1,000 is 500. And instead of one-tenth of a millimeter, we will move four-tenths of a millimeter. And this is very small, but we can see the logo moving a little bit, probably. It will be blurry. And if we put our finger on the cone, it will hum even more loudly. So... An octave below 500, that's 250. And four times 0 0.4 is 1.6. Now, 1.6 millimeters, we definitely cannot focus on the speaker cone when we look at it, and it would bounce off of our finger if we tried to touch it. Now, let's go another octave down, 125. When we go that, that to 125, we have to move 6.4 millimeters. And 6.4 millimeters is a quarter inch to us Americans. And that's a lot of travel for a six inch speaker. But in car audio, we play speakers below 125 every day. So let's drop down one more octave. 
and see what happens. We would go to 62 and a half cycles. And at 62 and a half cycles, we would be at 25.6 millimeters. That's over an inch of travel. We cannot expect that kind of excursion from a car speaker that has to fit in a car door. That would not be a, a good expectation. Yeah, and this is why subwoofers are essential for high fidelity. The larger area and greater excursion overcome this limitation. Yes, that is exactly right. It, it may be technically possible to build a six inch speaker that has an inch of excursion, but it's not going to fit in the door of a Honda or a Fiat. <laughs> yes, correct. And at Hertz, we recognize that the speaker has to be able to be stolen in the car to be considered a great car radio speaker. Right, that's a good realization. <laughs> now, this, this rule of excursion is what finally convinced me to stop trying to use really low crossover points for door mounted six and a half inch speakers. But that's probably a story for another day. Um, if we ignore this principle, it, it will lead to damaging speakers. You can damage woofers or mid ranges. And of course, you could damage tweeters if you play bass through them too loudly. So that's the rule of excursion. So remember that we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But now we're going to talk about the rule of dispersion. Now, I will also apply this to a six and a half inch speaker. It doesn't matter which one. This, this is a universal principle. Okay. And the, you, we just heard that the rule of excursion is why six and a halves in a door are limited on the bottom end. We need a subwoofer. Now we're going to talk about why six and a halves in the door are limited on the top end. And to do that, first, I'm going to show you a chart. Now, there's a lot of information here. Ignore the blue line. It's not going to help us right now. But the black, green, and red lines at the top show you the measured response of this home audio, six and a half inch speaker, if you're listening or measuring at different angles. So it's basically how it sounds when you point the speaker different directions. Now to simplify this, let's focus on the left side of the chart for just a moment. Below 100 cycles a second, all three lines are right on top of each other. And what that tells us is it doesn't matter which way you point the speaker. It will sound identical. It'll sound the same no matter which direction you point it below 100 cycles. Same below 200 cycles. So you can see in the base, doesn't matter where you aim the speaker, it will sound the same. Here is 500 cycles. You can see it's still pretty much exactly the same at 500 cycles. And at 1,000, they're very, very close. Finally, when we get to 2,000 cycles, you can see these three lines are starting to diverge, which means the speaker will sound different at 2,000 cycles, depending on which direction the speaker is pointing. And when you get to 3,000 cycles, you can see it's really pronounced. Your speaker will sound significantly different, depending on which way you aim the speaker. And above that, it becomes a huge problem. You can see that the speaker would work pretty well if it was aimed directly at you, but if it was not aimed directly at you, it would not perform well. Um, and here's a simpler way to think of it. In this gray zone, the speaker is omnidirectional. The performance is omnidirectional. In the yellow zone, it matters which way you point the speaker. And in the pink zone, that speaker better be pointing directly at you or you're not going to get good performance. I think this might be a simpler way to think of it. Below 1,000 cycles, Sound goes everywhere. Above 1,000 cycles, things start to get narrow. And above 3,000 cycles, it is really, really a laser beam. Now, these exact numbers vary a little bit from one speaker to another. But the principle is the same. And it is primarily driven by the diameter of the speaker. Um, excuse me. What does this have to do with car audio, if I can ask? Well, that is a really good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, just to do that, let me show you a picture of a car. Oh, he's um, a car. <laughs> and let's think about where speakers usually get installed in a car like this. The tweeters are up high. So the fact that sound is a little bit directional for different speakers is not as big a problem for a tweeter. But the six goes down here at the bottom of the door. And that's really far off axis compared to home speakers. Here is the speaker. Um, which of these is more similar to the listening angle in a car? Luca, the yellow line, which is 30 degrees, or the pink line, which is at zero degrees? Well, the yellow line is closer to aiming at our ears, but car door speakers are often farther off axis than that. You, you're absolutely right. 
at 30 degrees, you can see that the far speaker would probably be about right, but the near speaker would not. If I put in a, a listening or listening position here where our ears would actually be, you can see that the near side speaker in a car is going to be 70 degrees or more. And that is, by the way, that is why you install the same speakers in the left door and the right door, but they do not sound the same necessarily. So how big is this problem? Remember, below a thousand cycles, it doesn't matter. The spe speaker sounds the same no matter which direction we're pointing it. Now, if you put it in a car door above a thousand, it does start to matter. And it matters more the higher we go. So here is a, uh, an estimate chart showing the on-axis response of that speaker as if it was inside a home audio cabinet. Or like a car audio display board, maybe? Yes, exactly. You see where I'm going here. So <laughs> here is our chart with the gray zone and the yellow zone and the pink zone. And we're going to look at the off-axis response, which is what matters to us in a car. Um, so, so this, this is look, like a car door, right? Yes, yes. And this looks different, doesn't it? Here, let me hit another button. You can see the difference now. Yeah. Exactly. The sound from the speaker in the yellow and pink zones is very different if you're in a car. Now, here's the tweeter. We know we need a tweeter. The average crossover point for car audio two-way six and tweeter systems is around 4,500 4, or 5,000 cycles. Mm -hmm. And most car audio tweeters are not robust enough to play any lower than that. And I mentioned that this phenomenon affects tweeters, but we're not going to pay much attention to that right now because it's not as pronounced for tweeters. So if we're talking about 4,500 4, or 5,000 hertz and we add these speakers together on axis, they do great in the display board. Mm -hmm. Look how, how they estimate adding them together. Mm -hmm. the, they sum pretty flat, the tweeter and the six. So if I was going to build a home speaker, this would work great. And it works pretty well in display boards. But let's put it in a car. <clears throat> in a car door, we get this big dip around the 2,500 to 5,000 hertz octave. And we talked about how octaves are really significant. You don't want to have a problem that's an octave wide. <clears throat> so the rule of dispersion is telling us that home audio speakers will perform poorly in cars. And now Hertz addresses this problem in two ways. We look at the off-axis response of the door speaker, but we also look at the low frequency extension of the tweeter. You can see with the Hertz speaker, the performance in the yellow area is much improved. Wow, okay, so this is really important. Um, I know that you can't make the rule of dispersion completely disappear, <laughs> but you can manage it in development um, you can manage the linear high frequency response of the six and a half. Some of the techniques you can use there are how you design the cone and managing the inductance that's in a speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And depending on the model, Hertz uses both cone designs to make the upper end response more linear and inductance management techniques in the motor. We will talk about this more in a few minutes. Hey, now, Luca, you can't just lower the crossover point on the tweeter to solve this problem. If tweeters are made for home audio. They can't handle the excursion. This is why we blew up so many tweeters in the 80s. Yeah. Um, as you might know, Hertz tweeters also play lower than standard tweeters. And for this, can you explain more about tweeter crossover frequencies, maybe? Sure. The rule for a crossover frequency for a tweeter is to avoid the tweeter's frequency of resonance. <clears throat> that's the frequency that the tweeter vibrates at the most easily. And with any moving system, the resonant frequency of the moving system is where the greatest amount of distortion takes place. So I like to compare this to a wheel and a tire. And I'll give you an experiment that you can do at home. Next time you drive your car, before you get in, go up to one of the front wheels and pry this balancing weight off and put it in your pocket. And you will discover three things. Uh, number one, your car's wheel and tire assembly has a resonant frequency that has more distortion. And number two, that distortion is very obvious when you try to drive on the highway. And third, you should not listen to Ken and do not take off your balancing weight. Do not try this at home, okay? All right, it's probably best not to perform that experiment, at <laughs> least not on your own car. Okay, maybe on your buddy's car. Anyway, so tweeters have resonant frequencies and they end up being anywhere from 800 hertz to 2,000 
cycles. And that is not in the trouble. Notice those are all in the mid-range. And we're very sensitive to distortion in the mid-range. We want to minimize distortion in the mid-range. So our crossover filter has to attenuate energy at that resonant frequency so it doesn't get to the tweeter and cause distortion. You see here in this chart, the crossover filter is letting too much energy get too close to the resonance. So the rule I was taught back in the 80s was use a second order crossover filter, which is 12 dB per octave, and select a crossover point that is at least two octaves above the resonant frequency. And if you get any closer to the resonant frequency, it would be too close. So here's an example of that. And you can see with a 12 dB crossover, we've stayed out of our danger zone. Now, today, we often use steeper filters than 12 dB because we're using DSP active crossovers instead of passive crossovers a good deal of the time. So often today, I will use a 24 dB fourth order crossover filter with a steeper slope, and then I will select a crossover point that is just one octave above the resonant frequency. Now, remember, we, we just talked about when you're asking a speaker to play an octave lower, you will need four times the excursion. And if the tweeter can't handle that, you end up with a blown tweeter. Yeah. And in order to avoid that, Hertz pays special attention to the low frequency end of their tweeters, both the resonant frequency and discursion, of course. Many of our tweeters use tune chambers, just like vented enclosure for subs. As a car audio company, we put a lot of resources into this strategy. So you're saying that the Hertz six and a half plays higher and the Hertz tweeter plays lower? Yeah. So that would be the result in a car. You'd get a smooth mm -hmm. response in the upper mid range before even using any equalization. And it would happen on both sides. So you'd get better sound on both sides. I think that's the best way to make a two way set for cars. Make the tweeter capable of playing lower and make the six capable of playing as high as possible. But I have always wondered why more companies didn't use an approach like this. Well, I can say that, uh, but it does cost us more to follow this approach, I can tell you. Uh, we have to use larger domes and larger voice coils overall. I have been asked by installers a few times, why does Hertz make the tweeter slightly deeper? And why do they use domes that are slightly larger than some of the other companies? Well, this allows our tweeters to play lower the most much lower on average. We know in some cases it's a bit more work, but we believe it's worth the effort. So if you build a car speakers with flat response in the car, it will sound worse in a display board. This design doesn't give us an advantage in the display board, but it does give an advantage to the car audio specialists with great sonic advantages in car. Well, that's absolutely correct. And, and I have literally had this principle explained to me in the past by speaker factories who were urging me not to want to use a speaker that was optimized <laughs> for the car. And the rationalization that they gave me was it has to sound its best in the display board or no one will ever buy it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but we have faith in our specialist dealers that they will show the speakers to best advantage, even though we don't design them for demonstration board. We design them for cars. Many of our component sets have passive crossover settings recommended in the manual for use in display boards. Don't forget to read the manual even for a speaker. So something you may have noticed, these principles also help us understand why a three-way front speaker set will help us so much in cars when we can use a three-way set. When you're using a small mid-range, it has different dispersion characteristics than the six and a half and has different excursion characteristics in the tweeter, and that can help us get the best of both worlds. Yeah, and that's why Hertz has the three-way sets in both the Miele Legend and the Miele Pro lines. Well, those are some aspects of how you would design speakers for use in the car. Luca, can you tell us a little bit about the Mie Legend speakers and how they use these concepts? Happy to. And remember the region of Hertz speakers to have application-specific drivers for car audio? We now design and build our own speakers in our own facilities, specialized to be used in a certain mobile environment. We develop loudspeaker virtual prototyping software based on the console multiphasic platform. We develop it in-house. It allows accurate prediction of loudspeaker performance before we build the first prototype. That enables faster optimization in the development process. 
Some of you might heard of Clipper test and measurement equipment. Clipper test gear is the best way to test the speaker behavior with large signals, especially its distortion with playing at high levels. We don't just use Clipper test gear in the research and development phase. Hertz speaker production is Clipper tested 100% during the manufacturing process before shipping. Now, let's look at specifics of some of the Miller Legend speaker drivers. And if you were worried, we were not talking about Miller Legend speakers. Here's where we start. Please meet the Miller Legend family. It includes these four and a few more. Let's focus on this for a minute. The ML280 is a 28 millimeter, the ML700, the three inch mid range, the ML1650, the six and a half mid woofer, and the ML2500, the 10 inch sub. First, we will review some technologies that the Hertz R&D team have used in all these models. The ML280 uses a neodymium alloy magnet for maximum magnetic flux density. So I know neodymium is a rare earth element, and I know you can use it to make incredibly powerful small magnets. Yeah, and this is a part of how you can play so low and so accurately. This is not rare. Many companies use neodymium in their Twitter magnets today. However, Hertz uses neodymium magnets in all these legends drivers shown. It's almost unheard of to use neodymium in a 70 millimeter mid range, much less a 165 mid woofer or a 10 inch sub. But these are not traditional speakers, these are legends. So the amount of magnetic strength in a traditional ferrite magnet would make the speaker so deep it wouldn't fit in any vehicle. Yeah, and the top plates and the back plates of the cone drivers are made from special low carbon steel for greater magnetic permeability. That means that the motor doesn't change its parameters at high power levels. Every speaker has inductance. That inductance makes a speaker a very different load for an amplifier than a pure resistor would be. Yeah, but resistors don't play music well at all. <laughs> no, they don't. And we know that inductance also limits high frequencies. Right. Inductor coils are what we use in passive crossovers to limit high frequencies. Yeah. So they're similar to voice coils in that way. Yeah, yeah. And for that, we use uh, inductance management techniques in the motor assembly. Managing the inductance does two things. It improves high frequency linearity and extension and decreases distortion. In the ML280 tweeter, you can see the very small copper shelf shaped ring here. And with the ML700 mid range, the copper shed over the pole piece manages the inductance of the system. This helps the ML700 to have a very flat frequency response and extend all the way up to 20,000 cycles. In the ML1650 mid woofer, there are three elements to control inductance. The flat ring here, the aluminum shed here, and the aluminum sheets around the entire pull piece. The same sort of ring is used in the ML2500 subwoofer. Well, low distortion, even outside the passband of the subwoofer, is what makes great subwoofers seem to disappear and make it hard to tell where they are in the car. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the Miller Legend family uses larger than standard voice coils. The ML1650 midwoofer uses a 36 millimeter voice coil. Well, a larger diameter voice coil helps dissipate more heat, so you get more power handling. And for this size speaker, a 25 millimeter voice coil is the industry standard. The ML2500 uses a 100 millimeter voice coil. That's four inches across you could fit the mid-range inside it. <laughs> the use of all this neodymium probably gave you the additional room to incorporate these larger voice coils. That must yeah. have been made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And some of the techniques that help a speaker handle more power or have lower distortion at the same time work against efficiency. Uh, one of the targets of the Hertz R&D team was very high efficiency. One technique was used, it was the boundary free surround. Most surrounds have a hard transition where they are flat and parallel to the cone here, and then they have a hard right angle 
here. And you can see that the transition on the boundary-free surround is very gradual. This means that acoustically, the inner portion of the surround acts as a part of the piston formed by the comb, and the effective surface area, or SD, is greater than competing 6.5 speakers with half the shelf cone and surrounds. We use the same sort of thinking with our speaker cones. Most speakers have dust caps over the opening in the center of the cone. However, dust cap vibrates at high frequencies and damage linearity. This V-cone doesn't use a dust cap. This cone is a curvilinear design with the V-shape, of course, and this helps the driver have better high frequency linearity and lower high frequency distortion. It also improves off-axis dispersion performance, as we will show you later. This is the ML1650 cone, and we inject cotton fibers into the paper pulp to improve the cone's resonance behavior. And this is the ML700 cone, and we use the same technique here. That's another way we get such high frequency performance from ML700, allowing it to play to 20K if needed. With the subwoofers, you can see the V is not as deep, but the same concept applies. With the subwoofer cone, we inject minerals into the paper pulp to add stiffness with the minimal weight penalty. All four drivers use cast aluminum frames and housings. Cast aluminum is much harder to deform during installation and it acts as a heat sink, drawing heat away from the voice coil. So these are common design elements to this Miller Legend family of high performance drivers. So this right here is a really impressive list of speaker technologies. And remember, everything we've listed so far here, this is in all four of these speakers. Yeah, exactly. Now, let's look at each model individually for a moment. The 1650 has to perform excellently in both mid-range and mid-base application. We know that this voice coil is larger than the standard 25 millimeter but larger coils have greater mass, so we use copper-clad aluminum wire to make it lighter. The polyamide voice coil former is light, so that also reduces mass, and it withstands heat without transferring to the cone assembly, which can shorter the lifespan of a speaker. The Hertz R&D team use multiple different elements to manage induction. Let me show you why. Remember this chart of an O-Modio 6.5, how it started narrowing at 1K and beaming at 2? Let's look at the similar measurement for the ML1650. The tested angles are not identical, but we can get the idea. So, as you can see, is the omnidirectional below 500 cycles, still omnidirectional below 1000 cycles, Still omnidirectional here at 2000 cycles, an octave above the ohm speaker. And finally, here at 3000 cycles, naturally, it is just starting to diverge, being a much more li linear driver than the ohm speaker. The VCON and the inductance management have helped us a great deal. The bottom line here is in a car door, the ML 1650 has a flat response, an octave higher than traditional speakers. So this omnidirectional range goes up to 2,000 rather than 1,000 cycles, and the range of narrow beaming doesn't begin until around 4,000 cycles. Well, remember, we talked about an octave of sound being really important. It's a really big deal. So if this speaker is playing an octave higher in a car door, that's going to make a huge difference. And so this is why the ML1650 is the highest performance 165 millimeter mid woofer available at this price range. Ken, keep this in mind when making your final decision. I will keep, make a note. <laughs> now, the ML700, the mid range. That's an ML700? In the picture, that looks like the 10 inch subwoofer. Look, it is very compact. I'm okay. <laughs> It is a very impressive three inch mid range. Uh, and the neodymium alloy keeps the magnet very small, easing fitment into OEM dashboard. 
or a minimal size A pillar mountings. We mentioned inductance management technologies earlier, and with the ML700, the voice coil uses just a single layer of wire to minimize inductance and extend high frequency performance. The unified one piece V cone helps with high frequency extension and with off axis high frequency performance. That means the ML700 can play to 20,000 cycle and beyond. Well, it's important for a speaker to have a flat frequency response that extends past the crossover points to minimize phase shift. And I'm sure in some cases, this three inch mid range is gonna get used as a center channel without a tweeter. In those cases, this chart shows it would be a very good wideband speaker. Yeah. Now, continuing the theme, also the ML700 is the highest performing 70 millimeter mid range available at this price range. And please take another note. Now, <laughs> the flagship, the ML280 tweeter. And I have to say, while this speaker has many technologies in it, I also love the fact that it's beautiful in design. It has high performance, and I personally consider it a piece of art. I agree. It's a wonderful example of industrial design. And of course, with a speaker, you should be using the design to convey the beauty of the music. The powerful neodymium magnet is incredibly large for a tweeter. Most car tweeters domes are 25 millimeters, so some even smaller. 28 millimeter dome doesn't seem like much of a difference, but a 28 millimeter dome has 25% more piston area than a 25. Mercer face area allows higher outputs without higher excursion, especially at lower frequencies. Now, Tetolon is used to make our Twitter domes. It is a proprietary textile developed by our R&D team. Rather than standard silk, other organic fibers have been added to attain mechanical characteristics which deliver better sound. And the dome cross-section and thickness was optimized with FEA computer simulations for lowest distortion and improved dispersion on high frequency. The profile of the die cast aluminum faceplate was designed for optimal frequency response and dispersion. The frame structure and the rear load chamber are both CNC machined from a solid aluminum block to ensure mechanically inert response to resonances. The rear chamber is sized for an incredible 900 Hertz resonant frequency, 900 Hertz. Please also take a note on this. <laughs> this allows a much lower crossover point while reducing distortion. And here you can see the low density damping material underneath the dome. While here you can see different high density absorbing material in the rear chamber, which helps with the extending low frequency response. Well, in this case, tweeters are like, or subwoofers and tweeters are similar. If you control the resonance better, you will get better extension and, and better low frequency performance. Yeah, and here is the test results. The orange line shows the resonant frequency is just below 900 cycles. And you can see it plays at 20K off axis and well above 20K on axis. And you know- Oh, uh, I know where you're going here, Luca. <laughs> The ML280 is the highest performance tweeter at this price and size available. Oh, hang on, hang on, Let me write that down. Yeah, 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 yeah. write that down. <laughs> so it sounds like what you're saying is if you take the ML1650 and you take an ML280 and you make a two-way kit, you could make the crossover point much lower. I know that I read on the specs, the recommended active crossover point is 1800 cycles. And what that would mean here is that you could get a really smooth summed response in the upper mid range in a car, and you would get it from both sides. I bet that it would. Bleh, I bet it would rival three way kits. Yeah, yeah and we believe this combination, the Legend ML two eight and ML sixteen fifty together, have the best sonic performance you can get for a two way system. And the ASA agreed and awarded the two way MLK sixteen fifty as the best product award. And finally, the Miller Legend subwoofers. Here is a Hertz Miller Legend 10 inch sub with a neodymium magnet. You mentioned how rare this is. Again, a standard ferrite magnet with similar strength would not fit the enclosure. 
I know that neodymium is really expensive. It's not just the material, and this much material is probably very expensive, but the machinery that can magnetize a big chunk of neodymium like this is also very expensive. Yeah, impressive, yeah. Um, so if having this neodymium in subwoofers, that's a huge commitment for high performance. Yes, exactly. Uh, consider that it mounts a 100 millimeter voice coil. It's twice the diameter of many subwoofer voice coils. Copper clad aluminum wire wound inside and outside the former, reducing moving mass. The voice coil former is fiberglass, which is much lighter than metal formers. I, I should mention for a moment, many US installers do not like the idea of copper clad aluminum wire because they've used some power wire that they had bad experiences with that was copper clad aluminum. Um, please be assured for voice coils, using copper clad aluminum helps manage the weight. It doesn't have the negative side effects that you might be familiar with. Yeah. And to keep that wire cool, the back plate is vented to circulate air around the voice coil, resulting in higher power handling capability. The performance of this Legend subwoofer is so good, it won the ASA Best Subwoofer Award when it entered the market. Well, when we started working on this presentation, Luca, I didn't expect to see this much technology in these speakers. Yes, I hope this helps show the concrete benefits of using high-performance speakers and why they cost more. You can see that many of these challenges don't exist in home audio applications. They are specific to the car environment. And apart from big technologic wonders, the Miller Legend drivers look fantastic when installed inside the car, and they will bring you listening, emotion, and a great sound experience. Here are some examples of what our specialist dealer have created with the Miller Legend drivers. Here is the ML280 tweeter in a pod. And here it is integrated into an A-pillar on access for both top-end performance. Again, in an A-pillar on axis for best top end performance, but very attractive and OEM in appearance. This car has both the ML280 and the ML700 in the A pillar. So that's this one. And this one as well. We don't get to see inside doors as often, but here is a wonderful example of the ML1650 installed in the door before the panel goes back on. And here is a panel on the door, and the 1650 is visible using the beautiful die-cast grill provided with the speakers. You put a cast aluminum grill in the box? Wow. Yeah, correct. Now, beautiful door panel with the exposed ML 1650, again, with the provided grill. And here is a visible Hertz ML subwoofer. And here, too. And here are two installed inverted. The ML subwoofer are beautiful up or down. Now, I have presented, explained, and shown to you the wonders of our Mila Legend line. The ML280, the deeper and most refined tweeter. The ML700, the most extended mid-range. The ML1650, the best performing mid-base and the ML2500, the most flexible and compact high-end subwoofer ever. And I don't mention the price point here. These are legends and are priceless. So are you going to buy from me, right? Okay, you got me, Luca. I'm happy to buy these. I will send you my credit card and you can ship me the speakers. I will get the project started. I, I will be a happy man because the car is going to sound great and I hope my wife likes it because it's going in her car. Okay, very good. Deal done. And of course, Hertz is not just car speakers. We also mention amplifiers, OEM integration, DSP processor, marine and power sport products. And we will discuss these products more in the next coming episodes. But now is the question and answer portion of our program. All right. So everybody's already using the Q&A setting, which is really good. So I'm going to take this down and we're going to go to the Q&A here. You want to start, Luca? Uh, yes, there is a little bit of greetings here. Um, hi, guys. The chat room is closed. Uh, Rob. Oh, 
Marco's looking for new product. Not today. <laughs> hey, Rob's asking a good question about Clipple testing. Uh -huh. So um, there's two kinds of Clipple testing. There is the Clipple testing that is done in development, which a lot of companies will use. And then there is the Clipple testing that is done in production, which many fewer companies use. And often they don't do 100%, as, as Rob pointed out. So that is a big difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, Fernando Gonzalez is asking, hi, should this ML700 be mounting facing the driver or is it enough to be inserted on the dashboard facing up? This is one of those questions that we should talk about in the bar later. Um, <laughs> there are good arguments for both ways, and some people have very strong preferences one way or the other. So I will not make anybody wrong right now, uh, but I have heard good results both ways. And uh, I, I, I cannot tell you one is wrong. Um, hi, Luke and Ken. Hello from Portugal, from Luis Sardinia, uh, one of our uh, best viewers. Travis from Australia. You did it again, Travis, huh? Staying up late. And why is there no 300 millimeter subwoofer in the lineup? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? Uh, okay, as you wish. I'll, I'll talk with R&D, Travis, no worries. Great info, great speakers, thank you. Gustavo Beltrani from uh, Argentina. Hola, amigos, saludos desde Argentina, ansioso de tener sus productos aquí. Hola, Gustavo, espero pronto. Hola, Gustavo. Alejandro do Campo, Ken and Luca, congratulations. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Rob is greeting Stick. Hi, Luke and Ken. Uh, Ken, hello from Chetual, Mexico. Hello, Victor. Oh, Victor. So, oh. Fernandez Gonzalo. Fernando, um, what our goal was today was to make sure that we explain the technology that is in the products that are shipping today. So, we are obvi obviously always looking to the future. I'm sure Electromedia is looking to the future, but we really wanted to focus on the product that was available today and make sure that you knew more about it. Fernandez Carlos, felicidades, Luque Ken, saludos desde Mexico, greetings from Fernandez Gonzalo, Mexico, uh, Olger van der Orst from Germany, great job like usual, thank you, Olger, talk to you soon. Uh, oh, Thomas is pointing out that we didn't talk about the ML1800, and yes, <laughs> there are more speakers in the legend line, he's absolutely right, we only had time to talk about four. And that's too bad. There are more speakers in the legend line than just those four. Yes, yes. And and the ML 1800, we can say, is the counterpart of the 1650, just eight inch versus uh, the, but more or less uh, the, the technology we've been talking about also apply to this other driver, um, higher power handling and few few more options on that. But the, the, the essence is that. I from New Zealand, even Macbeth, oh. Love you hear from you. Rodrigo Esquivel, saludos, Luca. Ciao, Rodrigo. Uh, hey, uh, Travis Maddox from uh, Australia. Great training. Is the image slides in the relation to dispersion available to do a mini segment for my dealers? ML 1800, no presentation. Uh, uh, Travis, it, just depends on how much you pay, and then we can talk about it. It's a selling day today. <laughs> Let's talk about this, Travis. I, I would do it for you, Travis, but I don't speak Australian. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, French, uh, Phil Cameron, bonjour, Canel Luca, bon presentation. Merci beaucoup, as they say. Uh, Anthony, Mary, oh, my friend, Tony, come stai? Um, Fernandez Gonzalo, I'm from Portugal. Uh, greetings, and we are proud of an RM MPK 165P Pro set on a RAV4. I love that kit. Saludos desde Colombia. Answer my oh, email. Very sorted. Compared to other brands, your company, like, oh, what is your idea on the surround? On the surround, you mean the surround of our uh, speakers, you mean? Uh, I think that there are different surrounds used in different models. Even in the Hertz line, 
Uh, mm-hmm. There is not a boundary free surround in every model. So um, you you really have to look at the position of the model of the product and when it was developed to to answer all those questions. Dennis is greeting from uh, Holland. Uh, Ron Scott, thanks, guy. I love the session. Ciao, ciao, Ron. John Lammers, good work, guys. Keep up the good work. Ciao, John. Thanks, John. Have a beer for me. Anthony, over 15, still strong family in Carolina, and Antonio. Ciao, Antonio. <laughs> and uh, Michel Gorkiuk, uh, hello, Abby from BC, Canada, here, British Columbia. This has been very helpful for me to learn. I am. Hey, Michel. thank you. And uh, I, I know you're, I will be doing some work with your importer as well. So maybe we'll see you again soon. Dennis Jenin is saying, uh, we are thinking to make a demo car in the next period. Don't think about, just do it. Okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Love it. Sales Casper. Hi, guys. The sale is from Custom Motor, the Netherlands. Uh, thanks for the presentation, guys. Thank you for attending. Uh, hello, Luca. Uh, congratulations for 25 years and for many more. Very good point, Ricardo. I don't think we mentioned it was 25 years. That's yes, well, important. it's in the logo, though. It's in yes, the title. It's in, it's in the logo, and uh, it, ma- it makes us feel old. So we skip. <laughs> <it. laughs> Greetings from Liv- Riga, Latvia. Oh, there's a lot of international audience tonight. Oh, happy. There are. Uh, saludos desde Chile. Gracias, Luca. I can. Okay, Chile as well. Very good. Ken, so I think uh, uh, we can uh, um, go over and show the attendants the the email they can always refer to so there's an email you can refer if in the next days or watching the replays you want to contact us the support at electromedia.it we can reply you directly address to your distributor and think about talk about and share whatever is uh, going to be uh, needed so uh, i think i think we might be over right and uh, it is time to thanks our audience for watching us. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Stay tuned for the next coming episode. Goodbye from Italy. Hey, hey before you go home, you go ship my speakers, Luca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I go in the warehouse straight away. <laughs> and goodbye from Portland. Bye. Bye-bye.